Good morning, everybody. I've got between five and seven minutes to talk to you about open scholarship. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about the barriers and enablers of open scholarship. And where are we going? What does the big picture look like? So open scholarship in the context of the global pandemic that is COVID-19 has really shone a global spotlight on the importance of both access to and to open science and global collaboration in this space and access to evidence-based information and research for the acceleration of human advancements in real time. So if you take March 2020 to June, July 2020, all publishers in the science, health sciences space opened their gates, tore down paywalls and knowledge and research was free for all the haves in this world. Studies, for example, by Lee and Haupt have shown that countries increased their proportion of international collaboration and open access publications during the pandemic. And I'll share some links when I'm finished. If this open was, openness was not in place, we may not have the knowledge and vaccines that we have today to fight this pandemic. It was Sir Muir Gray, former chief knowledge officer of the NHS, who coined the phrase, knowledge is the enemy of disease, which has never been truer than today. So what happened from July 2020 onwards? Well, the paywalls were promptly put back up and the subscription model resumed. I have to emphasize that in a healthcare context, paywalls to research costs lives, and there are plenty of examples in this in the literature. The COVID pandemic has just increased the argument for open access as a means to reduce global health inequalities and enable researchers in underdeveloped and underrepresented nations to participate in large scale research projects. But open access and open scholarship is not enough. Even though paywalls were torn down, unless we reduced health inequalities and the divide between the have and the have nots, between the digitally literate and the illiterate, open access will never be enough. The vaccine war or the vaccine um, super league, as they're now calling it, is a case in point. People and nations are scrambling to skip queues with little or no regard for the developing world. Global problems need global solutions. Access to open access to research is a key enabler, but education and literacy to know what to do with that research is remains a barrier for many. Another barrier is the evidence to practice gap. As Sir Muir Gray said again, the application of what we know already will have a bigger impact on health and disease than any drug or technology likely to be introduced. Other enablers in Ireland are, for example, the Health Research Board and Open Science Europe in the EU are both using Faculty 1000 to provide open peer review services for research funded by their programmes. There's also the importance of citizen science, public participation in scientific research, which is really important, and patient empowerment. So, for example, the likes of Vicky Phelan is a key champion and advocate and a really good example of somebody that can have a really profound impact when they have the, the access and the knowledge and the wherewithal to, to do something with that research. A common barrier and an adage in public health is that the road to inaction is paved with research papers. So what are we doing, <clears throat> excuse me, in the HSE about open access and open scholarship? Well, I, as National Health Service Librarian, am a member of NORF, which Michelle has mentioned. The HSE has an open access publishing statement. My colleague, Padre Manning, manages Lennis, the Irish Health Repository, as a key enabler of open research and open scholarship. We get regular inquiries from researchers about getting their research published in an open way. Just recently, we, ha we had a request from a microbiologist trying to publish, wanting to make it open. They're pushed to, a pay, to pay an APC. They have no academic affiliation, so they come back to us and we recommend that they make a version of it available in Linus. So there is a role for repositories in enabling open research, and that needs to be highlighted alongside the transformative agreements that are taking place. In the HSE, we have a 10-year strategic action plan for research, the first of its kind. Libraries in the HSE are part of a new research function in the HSE. This is progress. Also in the library service, we've worked to make BMJ best practice openly available to every citizen in Ireland since 2020. Check it out. There's an app available. It's free for everyone to use. 
I would really like to do more in this space, but it costs money. Trying to get transformative agreements is next to impossible. The current subscription model for e-books and e-journals is completely unsustainable for all libraries and for humankind. The development of transformative agreements is raising some concern that it is perpetuating inequalities. Our own experience in the HSE is an example of this. Elsevier, Wiley and other big publishers that we have lucrative agreements with are completely unwilling to enter into read and publish deals with us. So on the one hand, we have IRL, which is achieving a good deal in signing transformative agreements for their members. But this unfortunately closes the door for other organisations outside of IRL trying to negotiate similar agreements with big publishers. And Ireland's too small to continue in this vein. So the potential is high for research outside of those big deals organisations to become ghettoised. I'm also a member of a newly formed knowledge translation team in the HSE with patient representatives on it. We intend to make progress and tackle this wicked problem. But where is open access and open scholarship going? What does the big picture look like? What does a world with complete open scholarship look like? And what are the implications for librarians? Well, it's really hard to answer that question. But there are two opposing routes that are emerging and in competition with each other. On the one hand, continuing with big publish publishers holding power via transformative agreements. Essentially, this is just a means to maintain the status quo and is not feasible for work produced outside of traditional academic settings. To the emergence of diamond and platinum open access and immediate OA publication and open peer review, like the HRB's approach, which takes the whole research on cycle on board from funding to publication. So then there is the rise of open research and the occlusion of associated data sets, coding, search strategies, etc., as part of the research ecosystem that surrounds the published article. There are numerous resources like Zenodo and Argos facilitating open research that will have profoundly transformative effects on scientific research down the line, allowing research to be verified, falsified, reproduced far more quickly and effectively than before. And I think this is the story for the next few years in open access, open scholarship. And I have to credit my two colleagues, Padraig Manning and Laura Rooney Ferris for help with some of this. Uh, we need a broader definition of what constitutes research and research impact along the lines of what is defined in DORA and measurement metrics like alt metrics. I don't have all the answers to these big questions, but that's what we're all here for. And let's start the conversation. Thank you.